in any form of historical research, obviously, we have dilemmas of authenticity and validity, which you have already pointed out as being rather disputable or debatable in the case of Jamila. Uh, I know a bit of her, her, her stuff because I've researched it on a different level. But I'd like to go one step further and say, how do we use the individual as being indicative or just as a unique individual case? And now we have other elements which are questionable, which puts it even further into dispute because a Muslim male cleric entering correspondence, was this really a letter he wrote or did she actually fake that letter as well? Did she really, and we have to use the word convert rather liberally, or was she more an anthropologist and field research developing a Stockholm Syndrome and <laughs> writing back on her observations, per se, and becoming localized? And to what extent have we have identified her as having mental illness? So the real question comes out for ego document research, as it is a case with, in fact, using his journalistic sources in historical research, to what extent can we use that individual case as just being an individual case, which is amazing, but what extent can we actually use it further to be indicative of a trend, a pattern, something which is. And the bottom line, obviously, is the learning of the methodological process to build upon it as is the validity and authenticity of agar document individuality versus trends in collective. Well, in the extended, in the article version of this paper, I, I address precisely that question. I think that um, the issues of, of the, like the veracity of the letters and of the events are of no interest to me, because. Um, it's, it's actually like the narrative that she constructs, which it, which which really attests to, to the to the document's historicity, because of the themes, be, um, and because how she constructs, you know, her authenticity. That's what interests me, and I think that 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 and I mean I, I don't know how successfully I did it. It does attest to a broader historical phenomenon. She's drawing from. Um, you know, larger cultural patterns that are uh, characteristic of, of the 1960s and 70s. You know, she could be uh, that, um, you know, we could place her there. She would seem to, you know, like this seems like a very rare case and, and very idiosyncratic, but look how, you know, how close this is to, I, I would say, the Balchuva movement. Mm -hmm. Um, but she was Pakistan then, and those movements were well documented in America. She was observing from Pakistan, America, wasn't she? Um, yeah, but she's there for, for, she's in the United States for long enough, and she's reading, um, you know, like, like she, she's quoting people like Norman Mailer in, in these books from the 80s. So uh, I think she's well aware of what's happening in the United States. and. and and so, like, yeah, there's one way of reading her as a sort of like reading her as a sort of subaltern, post-colonial thinker, um, which might be like the more obvious um, contextualization for what she's doing. But you know, the the I think that the the, the logic of what she she does, the way she she sort of constructs this identity, has draws on and, and owes its you know, owes itself to that place that, you know, the place that she's actually renouncing. And um, regarding, I guess, like the, the, you know, at the beginning of your question, you were mentioning like, oh, is she an ethnographer? Is she a... Uh... Well, well, yeah, she's gone there as an anthropologist, as she really converted in the true sense. I mean, you know, everything she's doing doesn't appear to be as a female Muslim in Pakistan. She's writing. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, it's like... <laughs> It's you'd say that it's a contradiction, but 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 like the, the boundaries. But she goes there as a, at least the way she presents it. She's going there as a convinced Muslim, she's not as a. But the way she writes is 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 as an ethnographer. But the talk was really really limited itself to 
the first volume of the memoirs, which is only about her, her time in the United States. It ends with her departure and this uh, renunciation of her parents. She's saying, oh, you know, the only Judaism that you can accommodate is the one that's, um, you know, is this consumerist, uh, you, know, con you know, like middle class convenience. This, is, this has nothing to do with the true Judaism. So, and she compares like conservative Muslims and conservative Jews, or, or like Orthodox Jews, Orthodox. you know, she, she contrasts them to, um, you know, to the parents sort of lies fair Jewishness, which is a betrayal of their tradition. I wanted to ask something also to Abraham about the like the very practical level. So you found all these letters in the original version in the archive, or no, you didn't? And no, they don't. Like, so sorry. Okay, yeah. and then to continue that, is it like you knew before that this is a focus? Is that something that is known, or did you find that out by yourself? And then how did you like this is a methodological question? How you work with the source? Clear for you then that okay, but I have I don't know what one two three letters and they are all made up so they are all made up for me. And did she change, for example, did you change her handwriting for um, writing the letters as an 11 year old? So about a bit of the sources. And the other question that I wanted to ask you is: Is there other gendered aspects um, in addition to the fact that she was a co-wife that are different in her narrative than the other narratives that you research and that you can speak about today? All right. Well, well so first, I, I like to acknowledge um, Deborah this is Deborah Baker's book, um, *The Convert: A Tale of Exile and Extremism*. And she, this, I think it came out in like 2011 or 2012. It's a book on Jamila, but and and it starts out with you know it, it's sort of like a detective story where she is rifling through the uh, Jamila's archives in the New York Public Library and there's all these unclear questions that come up about um, you know Jamila's life story um, for example like these these intrigues that she has in Pakistan with Maududi and her hospitalization is Maududi just trying to sideline her or is he um, um, or is she really does she really have mental issues and that's the reason why she's institutionalized and the and Baker's narrative is is very artificial in the sense that um, it completely disregards the fact that these um, these memoirs were published and Jamila is actually very open about her uh, about her mental history. So um, so Baker plays with the flow of information in order to create this sort of sense of suspense in the book which actually does not exist in the original. Um, but Baker is the first to, like, she, she talks about the fact that she, dis also she's surprised to discover that these letters aren't real. And she's absolutely right about that. Um, because what happens is, so the first volume, there's only a typescripted version of it, of the letters. But actually the, the letters of the second volume, which, are, which begin in 1962 till the mid-70s maybe, um, those actually do exist. And the correspondence with Maududi is also, um, it's also real, but she, she redacts it and she changes different things to just like um, give the story, you know, give her correspondence with him a better flow. There's sort of like, she first she changes her name to one, you know, she, she changes her name, I forget what she changes her name to. It's not Mariam Jamila at first, it's something else, and then he tells her, oh, that's a masculine name, you should change it to something else. Um, so she just wants to harmonize parts of her story. But uh, again, I, I don't think that the, um, the issue of the authenticity of the letters, is, it was not my concern. Now regarding the gendered aspect, um, it's uh, Mia Culpa, it's not something that I addressed. In, she in, children of her own? Yeah, she had four children of her own. She had four children of her own, and clearly she's not, the, the, like, nothing about her story is characteristic of of uh, you know traditional Pakistani women, she came in and she was already treated a bit like a superstar, and and you know she also didn't speak. She never really spoke Urdu. She didn't have full command of of, of Arabic, and you know everything she writes about Islam really comes through translation. Um, so so I I've been thinking about how to you know 
bring in the you know the, the gendered aspect of her story, I, I'm not at that point in the study yet. May I add something? The question I, I would raise is why should she behave like a traditional Pakistan woman? Because I, I just had the idea that she did exactly the same what many prominent men did. They changed their by Western men changed their biography according to I don't know how to be more prominent, to be more I don't know superstar and so on. I mean, only because she's a woman, she should not behave like a Pakistan woman. Why? Well, because she lived there, but she was an exception, right? She could she could afford to. She didn't have to adapt. No but that means that she convert. Yeah. yeah. Why didn't she have to no, adapt? This was is it because she was not fulfilling a propagandic no, role no, in for radical Islam. Islam. What other Pakistani women could not do, she was able to in a very conservative and patriarchal society. Yeah. What is the reason for that? And that projects back to the question of authenticity. How authentic is what she's saying when she's actually up? Ah, she's our Western showcase to show the world, yeah, we're good. We're ah, which any Pakistani woman at that period, you know, could not. But this do. becomes interesting precisely because the, the, because of this uh, contradiction. Like I don't think she becomes interesting because she because she becomes a case study because she beca she becomes a pure Muslim whatever that means she becomes a, a case a case study because she is writing in English about all these uh, persons. This is why also she becomes a case study for uh, for someone interested in identity processes. Because if not, she became a, a Muslim. I knew it would be interesting, but it would be we would be discussing something totally different. Would someone has to I think that. no. I mean, I don't. I'm answering for you, but no. Thanks. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no yes. Yeah. Some feminists could be decapitated in that very society. She is not. No. Who is enabling that? Is it because she's a showcase for Islam? I mean, the fact that she has this level of independence that most Pakistani women do not have shows that someone, Maududi, someone in the clergy, sees her as, oh, she's a great showcase for Islam, for our version of Islam. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i sorry, but keep on, I mean, who is the, I mean, who's profiting from that, and what's the power structure there? Which is kind of a basic question. I mean, I, I don't know if you have the answer, but, but it's in the background. Well, it wasn't a question that, that I, I mean, it occurred to me that, that this is not a, you know, that this, this is clearly not the story of an average Pakistani woman, but, but you know, how would that affect the story that she's telling? I'm not sure. Right? Not, cool. not everybody's good documents end to the New York Library. Right. <laughs> but but you, cool. you, you know that in Pakistan, maybe the archives are not that well uh, in such good conditions, maybe like in New York Public Library? Because you have to convert the infidel. I mean, so why is it in, in, in a non Muslim country where she chooses to have her. I mean, there is an agenda here, which is kind of clear, and it's fine to you know to point out that. But there's no shadow. We're looking for you know people the, the differences between what the facade and the real thing, and, and and it seems that your narrative kind of takes her at her not as face. You're not you do not take her at face value, but there's some problem to to, to look at Pakistani. Says, what is an average Pakistani woman? I mean, what's her you know what's her role? What kind of access does she have to speak to other men, to publish stuff? go around the world. So, so I'm just saying, you, you need to think about those things uh, to see may, maybe there's someone behind that. I don't know, not to dig herself, but, but you know other political forces in Pakistan that say, she's great for us. She's great for us. Um, you know, other conferences disappeared. <laughs> they, they, they simply, literally vanished. What, what's, what makes her story different? No, I, I, I think... You need I, more resources. I, I, I think, I think that the story... That. I think the story, like the story she tells, does undercut her version. It does, in in the sense that, um, you, 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 like this 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 transnational movement, you know, the diversity of sources, you know, the genre of the story she tells. It's 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 this is like if you look at people like Werner Solers, you know, at Harvard, and and like this construction of ethnic American identity. And, and this like celebration of outsiderism, you know, it's like I think he says like, you know, celebrating yourself as the outsider is is like the it's the classic American story, and she she she's um, she's participating in like the same tropes. That's what she's using to tell her story. So I, I, I 
I think that like the conservative Muslim image that she she's uh, you know that she's fashioning out for herself is very it, you know is not as conservative as she thinks it is or as she's presenting it to be. So I do think I see the shadow. May I just remark? I think the question and answers now show <clears throat> how difficult it is to work only on an ego document. Because as long as you have the ego document, you study it, you want to construct it, you see how it is coherent within itself, many people begin to ask you, okay, but what is the surrounding? Who promotes it? Who allows it? Who profits from it? And so on. So it is perhaps not so easy just to limit oneself to the ego document. For example, I'm at the question I would ask is, go to the Pakistani newspapers and try to see what reactions were there. But as soon as you ask this question, which is interesting, and you will ask a historian, okay, but this is not the ego document anymore. So it's really very, very tricky to study ego documents limited to ego, uh, ego documents. This, this story really reminded me of, uh, I'm going to try to say this in very few words. I, I feel there is, uh, a specifically Ashkenazi phenomenon that happens um, uh, during both in Europe and in the United States that have to do with the collapse of, uh, of traditional Jewish life. And we have, uh, in Europe, we have tons of examples, but I'm going to take a very clear one, a feminine case, Simone Veil. And the, uh, the self-hatred of Simone Veil, how Simone Veil who converts to Christianity, but doesn't convert to Christianity because of all these that which is also a privilege that she has to be here and there and to be um, exchanging all these letters with, with all these um, insane people that celebrate her incipient sentence anti-Semitism and how she goes back to a Judaism she doesn't know uh, to, to revisit and to criticize a Judaism she has never lived. And she goes and she cites the Bible, like there's Judaism does not really have the Bible. There's no practice in June who bases his life on the Bible, he bases it on the Talmud. And this is something that it's, I mean, it's ABC Judaism. And she doesn't know it because she's not a Jew. She's, a, she's an, an assimilated Jew who is in a specifically Ashkenazi phenomenon of the 20th century. And if we go to the States, this, when I was a, a listening, listening to you, I was like, wow, this is like the American version of Simone Veil, but with Islam, you know, because with whatever, this is like, she goes back to a Judaism she didn't she never lived because you know she grew up in a reform. I mean, with all due respect, but she go, she grew up in a in a, in a reform community um, with very little Jewish literacy, and she revisits that. And I was thinking of the um, not only spiritual void but symbolic void that was left for Ashkenazi Jews um, in this transition to liberalism. It's not only a spiritual void. It's uh, what do you do with that void? You either become Christian and start celebrating Christmas, or you look for something that cannot be given to you in your own family. So, I mean, I would, I would, this is, I, gen, I wanted to uh, I end my question, to that comment, and my question is, have you, have you compared it with cases of um, Jewish convert, and converts to Islam in Muslim countries? Oh, absolutely not, because I think that that would be a completely different kind of conversion. Oh, sure. in, in, in a conversion to Islam in a Muslim country would be kind of an assimilatory conversion that would allow you to integrate into the majority culture. It's pragmatic. In many cases, the cases that we know, right. at the same Morocco, which is what I know, it was many times pragmatic. So it was not, it didn't come from an ideology, like from an actual, actual conversion. But sometimes, many times, it was a pragmatic decision because it's not a good azaga. So you could, you know, how somehow work it out for you to be Jewish and not be an apostate. But I was thinking if, that it would be a very interesting comparison in terms of how Jew, uh, Jewish converts throughout the 20th century in Muslim countries faced um, their process of conversion uh, versus a liberal a liberal Jew. In the United States, I think I don't know. I mean, maybe you don't want to quit, but I think it would be interesting. And for um, Professor Lasky, I have a question. I've, um, I, I've I've read a lot of your work, and, if, and and it's been extremely helpful for my research and my so I'm very happy I to meet you. And but I've always had the same question. Um, I think the testimonies of the Shlichim also shed light on the situation in Israel, and on the, and on the way the, um, 
the archetype of the Mizrahi was, uh, was being shaped for political purposes. And this is a criticism, this is a critique that I've always missed. I wanted you to say it, and you were about to say it, and, and, and I, I, at least I haven't read. So I want to I wanna ask you directly, what do you think about this? What do you think the testimonies of, of the Shrikhim, not only on the Orientalistic, but also extremely offensive in terms of the way Moroccan Jewry is portrayed? I mean, speaking very clearly, because I want the clear question to be clear, what do you think? about this and about the way this testimony, the, the role this testimony is played in the way Mizrahim were being portrayed in this country? Well, I would, I would, uh, I I would distinguish, I would distinguish ah, between yeah, sorry. Are emissaries. emissaries or envoys, whichever. I would distinguish between uh, the policies that were implemented, decided and then implemented in Israel by what they call the Mossad Leteum. Mm -hmm. which, was a, which was a body that uh, coordinate between the Israeli government and the Jewish agency's top, uh, uh, top leaders uh, and the people, the, the emissaries in, in the field. And I've done work not only for Morocco but throughout most of these, uh, the, the Islamic diaspora. And I think that as far as, I don't think that there was, except for certain journalists who wrote about it, that clearly evince ra uh, racist ideas. Uh, in Jerusalem, uh, they were, some of them may have had, I wouldn't call it racism, I would call it, some of them had a narrow-minded view of these communities which they didn't know much about. After all, Israel was, was then a country of 650,000 people and they had to uh, uh, organize the immigration and absorption of, of people from countries they really didn't know very well. Uh, you couldn't compare them, let's say, to the Sephardim in Jerusalem or in, in the four holy cities of, of, uh, of uh, Eretz Israel, of pre-independent Palestine. Uh, and uh, uh, because many of them were true Sephardim and they were not, uh, as they would call them, Oriental or Mizra today the term we use of course, is Mizrahim. So they were, they, they were one component of it. I, I think that most of them were not racist. I think they were grappling with very serious issues of absorption. They were of, a, of a young country that had a lot of problems, that were bringing uh, people from third world countries, uh, and they didn't quite know how to absorb them. But the very fact that they did bring about the Saliyah, they didn't say, we don't want these people. They needed them. Yeah. Well, that may be true, but they did everything in later times, which I mentioned in my, in my conclusion, when the Mossad steps in, not the Mossad Laliyah Bet, the mm -hmm. Mossad, the Israel Secret Service organizes an apparatus okay, called the Misgeret, which once the gates in Morocco were shut down, an underground railway, as I call it, organized the immigration. If they didn't want these people, they wouldn't jeopardize and they wouldn't endanger the life of these various emissaries who went there. And the, uh, and the embarrassment this may cause once this whole issue was exposed. And it was exposed at a certain point when, that, when the ship uh, yeah, Pieces Oigos found, foundered between uh, Tangier and Gibraltar, and Israel continued the work, and then it paid money to the to the palace in order to open the gates again in Operation Yachid. So they did want it, whether it was for uh, pragmatic reasons or because they felt they, that, that, that it was part of what Ben Gurion called the ingathering of Jews from all parts of the world. The, now, as far as the emissaries, this is why I assume the emissaries. I think emissaries like Grinke or Zev Haklai or any of these, uh, or Amos Rabel from Kibbutz uh, uh, Dovrat. And I, think they were, I think they were idealists. I think they were naive. I think they were fascinated by, by the people there. They had some misconceptions. They thought they were all farmers, and they were not. The irony is that many of the Jews who came to Israel from Marrakesh or Casablanca and went into Moshevim, they were much better farmers than those who came from the Atlas communities. That many of them, after a short while, abandoned farming and they did other things. Let's not forget, most of the uh, uh, Jewish inhabitants, the 40,000 or so inhabitants who were there, 
uh, that were eventually evacuated by 1970-71. Um, uh, they were mostly peddlers. They were mostly selling the products of the Muslim agriculturists, the, the farmers. Uh, and only in the high atlas, Grinker found real, real farmers. But the, the real point is this. They often tried to circumvent the policies adopted in Jerusalem and to convince, as Grinker did, to convince the physician who had the final decision about selection to, bring, uh, to, to, to soften his, uh, his policies, and quite often he did. In other words, they, they collided with not only the policy, but the policy makers in Israel. They really wanted to bring these people to Israel. They truly, genuinely believed that they would be a tremendous asset to the country, and in retrospect, I personally believe they were an asset. You would think, how would Israel look today if the peripheries in the north and in the south, uh, they would be underpopulated? The question is, how would Israel... Uh, it, would not, it, would not it would not survive. The people in the periphery lived in the... Yeah. In the and and it would not... Country. That's right, and they would not survive. And not only that, in retrospect, we can also say that most of these people with the hardships that they face, and that, I wouldn't even try to, to, to outline all the hardships they faced and some of the humiliation. They were, they were forced to drink, they were working for some of the kibbutzim and they were forced to, to drink water from buckets. Hot, in hot days, hot water from buckets. It's not only what the David Levy was describing what was, what was happening here in the north. I talked to a lot of people in the south that faced uh, similar uh, situations. But you could, you could argue this, that uh, it was, um, in the final analysis, it was the right thing to do, despite the controversies, despite some of the uh, bad blood that developed between uh, the uh, uh, policy makers for immigration and the immigrants themselves. Uh, this was the solution to get the people out of there, because we know what is happening in these countries today uh, with the rise of Islamic radicalism and other problems exist in North Africa between Berbers and Arabs and, ident and, and the identity politics that exists between Berbers and Arabs and all the, the Jews would have been caught in the middle. They were caught in the middle then too, but they were evacuated from the big cities to more stringent selection. In the villages, in the final analysis, in a rescue policy, uh, uh, what they call Aliyat uh, Atzala, and it turned out to be of, of great benefit in the long run for the descendants of the immigrants. Not only for the descendants, but, but, but okay, I mean that's where I like a little bit. Yeah, but but I think that that I I think that it would be wrong to think that both the policy makers in Jerusalem, their representatives in Paris, which was one of the major offices caring for North Africa and Egypt and a few other communities, that they didn't want these immigrants. That would be wrong. There were journalists, and you may have come across an article by, uh, 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 by Gelblum, okay, uh, who wrote for Itona Haaretz. And if you allow me for a minute, I would quote what he said. Oh, I know what he says by heart. Okay, yeah. but I don't think the people yeah, yeah, here know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe I should, just for a second. But he blamed Yosef, right? No, no, I, no, 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 not no, at that time. Just one second. He's the new. He's the new. Okay. This is uh, this is Arya Bloom in March 1979, and I quote: "Zoi Aliyat Geza, those who know Hebrew, בין יוצאי טריפוליטניה, מרוקו, טוניס ואלג'יריה. אבל איני יכול לומר שהספקתי ללמוד מהותם של הבדלים אלו, אם ישנם. אומרים למשל שהטריפוליטנים והטוניסאים טובים יותר והאלג'יראים והמרוקנים גרועים יותר. אבל בדרך כלל הבעיה היא אחת. אגב, איש מהעולים האלה לא ישמח להודות שהוא אפריקני. Je suis français. כולם צרפתים מפריז, כולם היו קפיטנים במקי. לפנינו עם שהפרימיטיביות שלו היא שיא, דרגת השכלתם גובלת בבורות מוחלטת, 
וחמור יותר חוסר הכישרון לקלוט כל דבר רוחני. בדרך כלל הם עולים רק במשהו על הדרגה הכללית של התושבים הערבים. הכושים והבר... אני לא יודע אם הוא מתכוון לברברים או ברברים שבמקומותיהם. בכל אופן, זוהי דרגה נמוכה עוד ממה שידענו אצל ערביי ארץ ישראל לשעבר. בניגוד לתימנים, הללו נעדרים גם שורשים ביהדות. לעומת זאת, הם נתונים לגמרי למשחק האינסטינקטים הפרימיטיביים והפראיים בפינות מגוריהם של האפריקנים במחנות, כמו עתלית וזה, תמצא את הזוהמה, משחק הקלפים בכסף, שתייה לשקרה וזנות. רבים מהם מוכי מחלות עיניים רציניות. זה הדבר היחידי שפה אומרים. מחלות עור ומין, כל זה בלי להזכיר פריצות וגנבות, אלמנט א-סוציאלי, א-סוציאלי. זה אין דבר בטוח בפניו. ודאי שכל היהודים האלו זכאים לעלייה. לא פחות מאחרים, ויש להעלותם ולקולטם. אבל אם לא יעשה דבר זה בהתאמה לגבולות היכולת ולקצבת הזמן, יקלטו הם אותנו, ולא אתנו אותם. אותם. ו-here's the punchline. <laughs> אולי אין זה פלא שמר מנחם בייגין וחירות דורשים להעלות את כל מאות האלפים הללו מיד, כי יודעים הם שהמונים בורים, פרימיטיביים ועניים הם החומר הטוב בשבילם, ורק עלייה כזו עשויה לעלותם לשלטון. לא, אבל בואו נגיד את האמת. מרץ' 1949. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to associate that even with the policy makers in Jerusalem. Definitely not with the emissaries who really meant well. You, if you read also Zef Haklai, I couldn't bring everything here, who also had sort of ego documents of his own. Similar things were said by him. He was doing his utmost to bring Jews to Israel. He didn't think in those terms. Their misconception, the fact that they thought that some people were primitive, I don't know of any group that came to pre-independent Israel, to Palestine, who didn't face insults and other problems, including people, including refugees from Germany. <laughs> Terrible things. So, but, but, the emissaries, but the emissaries, that's a whole different situation. There was something, I would say, there was even something positive about their naivete. That's what I would say. But they were risking their life. They could have done other things besides go. They were all in the Itiashvut Aovedet. They were all in Moshevim and Kibbutzim. And they really, truly wanted to bring the people to Israel. And, uh, and they did. They did. Like the Ethiopians. Without them, it couldn't have been accomplished. There was no uh, apparatus that could organize this massive aliyah. Documents that are not to be published or uh, partially not to be published in your case. But in your case, they are documents that are to be published, meaning they are public. So, do you have anything to say about an ego document that is aimed to the public? So, it, it goes to certain censorship. It goes through other ways that the, the, the document that Mikhail was referring to. Avram was referring uh, and he decided to put a, a thing in a certain archive, it still is an archive, so nobody sees it until he decides to go there. But in your case, it's all published. And, and, and I would like to add to it because I have been working on uh, rabbinical response of the 19th century, and in many cases I had to read the pre preface by the author, not the, the uh, those who are commanding the book and others but by the authors. And in just two cases, I found really a sort of insight that one gives <coughs> upon himself. In your case, it's all of it. So in your case is that Leon is giving an insight what why did he do this, why did he do that? So uh, I think that uh, it is a unique kind of accurate document. And uh, when we do research on the documents, we should look at which source, which kind of 
Anchor document we are dealing with. So that's basically. I, <clears throat> I fully agree. Uh, the thing is that he thinks that his own experience can teach everyone ah, exactly. something, and that is a kind of exemplar. Mm -hmm. And um, so, on the one hand, there is no doubt about the authenticity of what he described, mm -hmm. but indeed, as you say, he wishes it to be public and to show the way to other people. Yeah, but I agree that it's not the same thing as something that he writes for his own usage. Thank you again, all three lecturers.